Welcome back, friends. And before we get started, I have some coaching announcements. Now, we are going to be launching a 10-week podcast contest. That means that we're going to be giving out prizes every Friday for those who are putting in reviews and five stars and sharing. Now, make sure that you screenshot and you share with me on social media. Next thing, if you're local to Ottawa Hall, I have bike mechanical bike maintenance clinics that you're going to want to check out, learn how to patch a tire, change a flat, and then I have learned to group ride clinics. So if you're new to cycling and you're worried about how, how to bike with others and bike safely, this is a clinic for you. And then I have my online cycling skills program. The first one is a four hour cycling skills intensive. The next one is four weeks where you work one-on-one with me. The third one is a four video module download that you can work at your own pace. You can get all the details on my website, sylviedow.ca. Now, the last part is the fitness component. It's hard to be a well-rounded cyclist without weight training and strength training. So I have launched a cycle fitness on-demand membership, and this is for anyone, but specifically, I'm targeting those cyclists who want to be well-rounded and strong and improve their cycling and also into a, a life of longevity. Go to cyclefitness.online and take advantage of the free seven day trial. Try it out, check out the workouts, see what you think, enjoy, and thanks for listening. All right, everyone, welcome again to another amazing episode of Secrets from the Saddle, all things cycling. And with your host here, Sylvie Dow, and I'm super excited to bring this amazing lady. Julie Walsh to the podcast. And before we bring Julie in, I'm just going to give a little bit of her background and then we're going to just dive right in. Now, I found Julie um, on a cycling Facebook page, as I find a lot of people. She posted a really extraordinary post that really triggered me to really reach out and ask her if she would be um, a guest on my podcast because there are, there's quite a few people on my podcast already and I still have more coming on that cycling really saved their lives um, or athletics saved their lives. And, and, one of, and I'm one of those people. It wasn't cycling for me, but it was sports through high school that got me through and out. And I found cycling in my thirties, but let's, we're going to dive into Julie's uh, bio right here. And then we're going to get her um, to start telling us about her story. So here it goes. All right. So Ju- my last name is, um, my last name's pronounced Wallach, which is Wallach. hard to okay. connect all the dots, but I'll just, Wallach. just for All right. So Julie Wallach. Yes. Thanks, thanks for it. actually. Sure. Thanks for uh, for correcting me. <laughs> sure. I was like, right. I'll just let it go. But uh, no, yeah. no, just you should for never. The sake of clarity. Yes. <laughs> okay. So Julie Wallach is a lifetime athlete. She started swimming in the ocean at two years old and was on a swim team as a child. Became a runner at eighteen when she got sober and ran consistently until last year. When she, uh, when she had an injury and had to make, and that made her rethink the sport, as usual writing does. <laughs> like running usually drives you to cycling. Um, she moved over to road cycling woo, and has fallen in love the same way she did with swimming and running. She's climbed Mount uh, Whitney, the tallest peak in the lower 48 U.S. states, and has left tracks on thousands of miles of trails in the Santa Monica Mountains. Uh, athleticism has always touched Julie's heart in any way, uh, in a way nothing else does. It's where she feels most connected to herself. With a history of complex PTSD, a survivor of sexual assault and molestation, neg- neglect during her childhood, and alcohol- alcoholism in her family. Julie has, um, was resourceful and found a way through being athletic, as most of us do, and spent a lot of time of her childhood on a bike. 
Writing was the Julie's way out of her house as a young girl. After the pain of childhood, it took a long time to get back into the bike as an adult. But Julie is so glad she did. Yay! Yay! <laughs> it was a new passion and athletic challenge for her, as well as a way to heal her past. When she's not riding, Julie is a research and published author, which maybe I should add that to our question at the end. She returned to college in her 30s and graduated with high honors, um, an exceptional student, and defines the odds of graduate college. Yeah, you can still go to school Yay. 30s and do <laughs> more focus though, right? 100%, <laughs> yeah. Usually important to her, she has spoken, and this, we're going to touch on this at the end, um, at um, legislation hearings to get law passed in California that, lefts the, that lifts the statute of limitations for a group of sexual assault victims, as mm -hmm. she is one of them. So welcome, Julie. We have so Thank much you, so to touch me. on, um, but... I would just, you know, welcome you in with open arms because, you know, mm. I kind of feel where you've come from. And um, let's go back to that, if like to the start, like when bike, yeah. a bike as a child was your way out. Yes, so. 100%. So first of all, thank you so much for having me today and for asking me and reaching out. I I think you ended up in a, you know, one of those, like, do you accept her message boxes? And it took oh, me a yeah. while to We're find We're not quite you. friends. You know, you're I like, know, but, that but that? now we are. And I love how that works. And so thank you for reaching out and thanks for having the podcast and, you know, um, doing what you do. Um, so when I was a little girl, I, I got a bike. I got a hoopty handlebar, banana seat bike, and it was, you know, Everybody all has the banana seat out. bike. Right? I loved my bike. You had and, one. Right? I just, it was the best. And, um, and I just remember the feeling of going, there, there was a teeny tiny slope on my driveway, like, like barely any kind of gradient, like, you know, what, maybe 1%. And I would go up it and I would feel like, Ooh, if I push myself, I can get up over this little thing and then drop down in the in the driveway and head out and the feeling of freedom that I had on my bike, it was not, it was like, it was a combination of what I was leaving behind, which was, you know, just a, it was a disaster area of a home. It looked lovely. We were in a beautiful neighborhood and two fancy cars in the driveway and a pool and a paddle tennis court and all this stuff, but it was a disaster area inside. And, and I remember I'll share about what it was like to get off the, the driveway and head out. But um, one of the feelings, just to sort of encapsulate what it was like, I was in my living room and my mom and my dad were watching Wimbledon or something. And I, and I remember looking out to the next door neighbor. So our, our living room window looked sort of almost at a diagonal to the neighbor's kitchen window. And I remember looking into their house thinking, well, how the hell did I end up at this address? Like somebody put me here and it's, it was like, like a, the, the wrong delivery. And, <laughs> and I remember being so sharp, emotionally sharp as a kid and really being in tune with like, this is not for me, like these people and what's happening here. It's like, there's injustice in this home. And like, I, I want more, I want love and, and I want to feel safe. And, so there was so much distorted kind of definitions of what love was. And, um, you know, my mom, I don't remember ever really seeing my mom sober. Um, and that was really rough. And my dad, <clears throat> my dad was, uh, my dad sexually abused me as a kid and I have two older sisters and, um, you know, keeping a giant secret in the home and having everybody feel that energetically, but not talk about it was total hell. And I felt so alone. So one of the feelings of being alone, um, like I loved my solitude. I could climb trees and sit and read books up there all day. And I was like, like a little monkey. And I was so, and I could dive off the diving board and backflip and feel like free. And 
I had no problem being alone, but the feeling of isolation and loneliness and not being able to talk about what was happening to me, that kind of emotional isolation was um, devastating. I was devastated. So I could take off and go and do stuff on my own, but I, I took all my pain with me, you know? And even your, though- Were your sisters part of that too? Or were you, did you get that because you're the youngest? Or were you know, all- like, I don't, like I've, we've had discussions over the years about what their experiences were and I wouldn't want to speak for them and what they went through. Um, just for confidentiality, I can just say that the whole family was affected and um, deeply affected by what was going on. And, you know, and the flip side was my parents were um, super progressive and like wanted us to have good education and sent us off to cool, like progressive new schools in Los Angeles. And, um, and I got to kind of, you know, and my mom worked for the Fair Housing Council, which helped people move into neighborhoods who were people of color in the 70s when like nobody was doing that. So there was this kind of like advocacy and volunteerism outside of the home, but inside we, we, I didn't feel cared for. So I did get some great stuff out of my childhood and I can see the whole picture now, but when at the time I was really seeing through the lens of a lot of pain. So I get on my bike and I was like, bye bye I'm leaving you guys behind. And what was I riding to? Well, I mean, I remember all the potholes in the neighborhood. I remember where I had to dodge, you know, certain boulders that would fall off the hill side and, and, and I could get away. I'd go down to the local pharmacy. I would save up money for bubble gum and I'd get down there and throw my bike on the ground and run in for my great bubble yum bubble gum and <laughs> I saved four dollars and 25 cents to get it. Like I Boy, did that go a long way back then, eh? <laughs> tell me. And I would chew like three pieces at a time. Jube jubes for a Oh my cent. god. <laughs> loved it. Oh my gum. I loved my gum. So I had this like life outside of home on my bike that my bike allowed me that transportation to get the hell out of Dodge. So I used it. And so, so during all of that, um, oh my God. So during all of that, we were living in this beautiful home. Turns out my dad was doing something behind the scenes that created a disaster. We lost our house. He had committed a crime. I didn't even know what it was, but I like, he's like, hey, can you show up to court for me and like support me? So we were, we showed up at, and my dad ended up going away to jail for like on weekends. And, and that story continues too. He, he just got out of prison and he's 85 years old and he just got out of federal prison. Like my dad lived his own, you know, very painful life. And so we lost that house. And when we lost that house, I stopped riding my bike. My parents got divorced. We moved to a beach town. Um, I had a beach cruiser, but it was like, I, I was starting to kind of go on an emotional decline. And- um, How old were you and all that happened? I, really? so about 13, 14. And my dad yeah. somehow pulled it off and like got out of the, whatever crime he committed and served his time. And I mean, it was, it was, it was just a mess, but he ended up living on the beach in Santa Monica in this beautiful place. And I don't know what happened behind the scenes. I just know that my dad um, managed to probably con someone else. I don't know. It doesn't even matter, but um, I started to think, well, if, you know, if boys like me, then I'm fine like then I'm okay. And I had this, you know, long lean body and it was like, okay, well, I'll just use that. So all through high school, started drinking, um, didn't, I was not athletic in high school. I was partying all the time. I was one of the cool girls with the cool dresses and, you know, kind of hippied out, but also in the rock scene. And like, I, you know, satisfied everyone's desires and made sure that I was a total chameleon and like, if this one likes reggae, I'm going to listen to reggae. And if this one likes hard rock, I'll, I'm tuning in the cart hard rock. And so I had this like image of being one of the cool girls, but I never went to school. 
I was drinking during the day. I ended up going to a, a school for people who couldn't go to school. It was one of those like, we'll put you here in the morning and then you can like leave at, at lunchtime. And so it was a bunch of like these hoodlum kids and I at this, you know, school for the, the troubled kids. Um, and I actually had a lot of fun there. And I started writing um, for one of my classes. I, I had an English lit class or whatever it was. And I started writing and my teacher said to me, I know that you kind of feel like garbage about yourself academically and I can tell you, you are an amazing writer. Just keep writing. You have raw talent. And I was like, yeah, right. Well, it was the only class that I got a B in throughout high school. And um, I ended up barely graduating high school. But when I graduated, I got out of my house. I left all of it behind. And I, and I really, and I vowed to myself, like, I'm not going to drink. That's it. I'm going to live a different life than my mother. I'm not going to be in the disease of alcoholism. I am finding something else. And I moved a couple hours away from my family. I felt so guilty. Like I should, like I should stay loyal to them and that lifestyle. But at the same time, I was like, see ya, I'm out, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. um, right. <laughs> so when I got two hours away in this an another beautiful beach town in Santa Monica, I thought I was leaving all my stuff behind. But a lot of my friends were up there. It was still the same scene. And I couldn't really escape what was going on inside of me. That was what I really wanted to get away from. And it didn't matter how far away I moved, I was still going to be there, right? So a few months into living there, I was, I, I was kind of taking a look at myself in a different way. And that bumpiness of transitions from adolescence to adulthood and like am I independent who's like I want to be cared for but there's no one to care for me I need to get a job I was going to go to a, a community college I did go to a community college anyway I woke up one morning February 22nd 1988 and I looked at my I, I remember the way the sun was shining in the room and I was three beers into a six pack and it's like 11 in the morning and I'm 18 years old and I'm supposedly like this independent, you know, I've got it all together. Look at me in my cool apartment. And I was, a dis I was like, I was in so much pain and I looked at the beer and I thought I cannot take another sip. Like I'm done. And for it to happen at such a young age, like I, I'm just, I'm so glad it did. And I ended up going to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting that day. I haven't had a drink in 33 years. And, and I will also say that during that, I had bumps along the way too. And I took some anti-anxiety pills from a doctor and I was like, it's fine. And I'll just take one. And then I started like taking 10 and, you know, so I was like, okay, I, I, this is in me. If I'm having pain that I don't want to feel, I'm going to try to do something about it. Right. So, um, but when I got sober, I started drinking, I started um, running. And I remember running like a mile and thinking, this absolutely sucks. I hate this. I hate everything about this. It's like, why do people do this? But I have to say, being skinny was more important than anything else in my life at that time. Like, by whatever means necessary, I am going to be like, you know, super skinny. Cause I, I was like getting, you know, I was, I, I got hips and I was like, what the hell is this? I was always this bean pole. Like I need to stay skinny. And I started, that was the beginning of mild to moderate body dysmorphia that turned into exercise bulimia. But when I ran and I hated it, I got a mile out and I was like, oh shit, like I have to go home now. Like I have to run home. <laughs> what the hell did I do? So that's funny. Like, oh my God. But here's the thing. My heart rate started to go up. I started to get some endorphins kicking in. I was like, uh -oh. oh my God, I love this. I love it. I'm in. By the time I got home, I was like, I gotta go running again. So I just got <laughs> go, go the other direction. Totally. I was so madly in love with it. And I and I, um, and it became like, okay, exercise is the thing. That's the thing. So I, I like a, yeah, I have like a similar kind of little story. 
I left high school exactly like at age 18. As soon as I graduated, I was gone with boy living with a boyfriend. That turned into me living by myself in a dodgy area in Montreal. Mm. So I was not on a nice little beach, but I was in my apartment. <laughs> and I remember, and I, I was smoking at the time, and I was always into sports. And if you picture this, so there's like the row houses and like they're three stories high. So you got three apartments and I'm sitting on my second floor um, steps and I'm sitting there smoking and it was, you know, probably like, you know, around 11 and I was sitting there and I was looking across the street and I was this guy and his wife beater, you know, like his uh -huh. you know, white tank top and yeah. he's just sitting there and I'm like, oh. <laughs> it was just like, I have to quit smoking and start. Right. And this thing, I said, I went for a run, but I oh went God. swimming. Like I decided, like, I don't know what time of the year it was, but it was, you know, probably spring. And I went out for a run and then I went and I'm like, okay, I'm going to swim. But that was when mine started. Just like, I have to quit this and like, yeah. I have to, like, like do something with my life. And yes. uh, this is like the turning period. And I just, quit I mean I smoked a little bit after that right but it was just like and I was looking around I'm like I better do something or right. this is my reality like totally like, yes the, yeah you know no like thanks. the dredges of like Montreal oh, yeah totally depressing gray yeah. dark murky yeah. miserable <laughs> yeah no thanks <laughs> But it's kind yeah. of amazing to have that switch, right? Like mm -hmm. I, to sort of look at it and to have a moment of, oh, wait a minute. This is not only like, is this going to continue to be my reality? And that looks pretty awful, but this is my reality right now. And yeah. I don't want it. And it's such a freeing and also horrible feeling like all at once. For me, it was just like coming into seeing what was really going on for me was <clears throat> was really painful but it was also the moment of freedom that I didn't even know I was walking into a new door I had no idea this is not okay no idea anymore this is right. not okay I need to like figure it out like right now right, right now, now. <laughs> right now exactly right now. that's so yeah. great thank you for that Sylvie because it uh, I hadn't like put the kind of that thought process <clears throat> into it enough to really remember what it was like to say, I have got to change my life. Like, <clears throat> and even opening a phone book and calling Alcoholics Anonymous, it wasn't the same as now, but it was like, I called and I was like, I don't know what to do, but I've got to do something right now. I've got to change my life now. So thank you for that. And um, yeah, so I, I started working with people, um, who had different special needs, people with, um, with severe autism and schizophrenia. And I worked in this amazing um, hospital close to the school and I started working more than I was going to school. And I realized like I needed financial independence. Nobody was really, my dad had said he was gonna help me and then he reneged on it last minute. And I was like, I gotta take care of myself. And I was in total survival mode, even though I was, you know, I was getting sober and I was getting my life together. I was starting to have flashbacks of my childhood at that time. I got into therapy in 1988 when people were kind of like, not really, it wasn't so cool. And you didn't have Instagram to tell you about your trauma. Like I was kind of like on my own. I don't own. know if that's like, good anyways. <laughs> I, it's got, it's, it's got, I think that it's like, it's, oh. it's like, okay, I can identify, but then there's so much information out there that people are like, you know, becoming their own therapist by way of Instagram, <laughs> which, yeah. whatever, you know, but I think, um, at the time I just felt super isolated and I would go to bookstores and like try to find self-help books and, um, find ways like to heal. But I really was kind of just, you know, searching in the dark and, and I had a great group of friends, but what happened at that time, I joined the Y, I joined YMCA um, you know, the, this like, it was an amazing gym and they had a pool and they had racquetball and they had, um, they had a huge aerobics room and aerobics was so big at the time. Oh, yeah. And I started taking classes. Oh my God. I was high impact aerobics 
all day. So I would run, I'd go to the Y, I would, you know, I started taking these classes. I had so much fun. My dog's saying hi. And, um, and they're like, hey, you're great. Like, do you want to teach? So I started teaching step classes and high impact aerobics. And I was, you know, in my thong leotard and bicycle <laughs> shorts and like, but I swear to you, I was so freaking hungry. I was like, I'll eat an apple and then I'll go work out. I'll have a cookie and like diet Coke and then I'll go do weights. So there was a lot of like unhealthy, not knowing how to do it in a way. Like I, I love the athleticism and I love the endorphins and I loved feeling strong and I love leading groups and all of that. But I was still, I was like, I, I just need to be gorgeous because if I'm not gorgeous, then I don't have a lot of value. And so there was like a sadness and like a desperation and a running to like literally and figuratively running to like finding ways to feel like I, you know, had some self-worth. And so I got it from athleticism, but I also, but there was a trade-off because I was like, you know, I can't gain a pound or I'm, you know, or I'm ugly. So I was carrying a lot of that and that was rough. And that was like, you know, my early twenties. And I started, um, I started backing off a little bit and I just, I broke up with a guy and of course, like, what do you want to do but eat ice cream? So I started eating a lot of ice cream and I couldn't keep up with all the working out and how much ice cream I wanted to eat. So I gained some weight and I was like, I need, to, like, work out more. Ah, I need to work out cream. more so I can eat more ice cream. <laughs> so I got, so I was like, okay, switch to frozen yogurt move home <laughs> like that's a good you know, that was that was I don't feel so bad head. so I would eat like this giant frozen yogurt for dinner right like that was my dinner <laughs> it was just insanity and um anyway I moved back home to Los Angeles and I really kind of was like listen I, I had another moment with myself where I was like, I really, I really want to have kids. Like when I was a kid, I didn't really, I wasn't like, oh, I'm going to dress up in wedding gowns and like pretend to be married. But I really, but I would always have dolls and I would always take really good care of them. And I always wanted to be a mom. And I was like, I need to break the cycle in this family system. Like I have already gotten out physically. I'm working on stuff emotionally. And I went really deep into therapy at that time. And I really just like took a time out from a lot of stuff. I had a kind of a job I was like, whatever about. And I just spent a whole lot of time going in and healing that trauma and starting to see the, you know, the pain that I had lived through as a child and a teenager. And I mean, just to give you a glimpse, like, when I was a teenager, my dad had divorced my mom. He was married, I think it was the second wife, maybe the third, I don't even know. And she was super jealous of, of my sisters and, and me. And she, we were at our house one day and I was still like trying to reconcile that I like, like my dad is creepy. Like, I don't even know how to deal with that, right? Hi, kitty cat. <laughs> There's my cat. so perfect. I love it. <laughs> hey, little tail. Um, How do you do this so, habit of, like, getting up onto my desk? I love it. It's just going to hang. That was so perfect. <laughs> so, yeah. So, anyway, I was at my dad's, and, uh, and his wife had a hot cup of water and chucked it at me and, like, threw it on me. And, um... There were my sister and her boyfriend at the time were there and they were like, let's get you the hell out of here. So that's just kind of one example of what happened in my life. Like it was, it was horribly painful. And I just kept burying that, burying it with either alcohol or, you know, all the eating stuff and the athleticism was, it was just a disaster. It was, a, it was really painful. So I went in and I started delving into all that stuff in my twenties and I, had loved, loved, loved this guy so much that we, you know, the one that, that we broke, we mutually broke up. And um, a week later I met who would become my husband. And I remember sort of feeling like, well, it's not the same kind of passion that I had with this other guy, but 
he seems like he's a really kind of solid guy and I feel like we probably do really well family wise. So I thought I was making a really smart decision. And in some ways I was, I mean, I, I was like, okay, it's time to kind of like put the practical hat on and do the things that make sense as a grown up, like whatever the hell that meant, right? So by this time I'm in my mid to late twenties and I start thinking like, I really want to have a child. I don't want to be in my thirties when I have kids. I really want to be like maybe 30 max, but I, I kind of like had this regimented agenda, which was very much in order with like the way that I lived. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm going to do all this work and therapy and I'm, I got married. And at the time I was getting ready to like get, you know, like we were talking about getting pregnant and I went for an exam, for a gynecological exam, and I had an irregular pap smear. And I was, and so my gynecologist referred to an oncologist. Gynecological oncologist. I went to this, went to him, and he sexually assaulted me. And at the time, yeah, at the time, I was in my late 20s. I'm like getting ready to have a baby. I'm not pregnant, but I'm like, I want to get pregnant. And I, and he did irreparable harm to, to my body. Horrible. And I talk about this, like, you know, it's, I'm, it's so intense and I don't want to spend the whole time talking about it. So I'm kind of skipping over, but it's so, it's, it's so intense and heavy. So at the time I, um, I filed a complaint against him and it just went away. They didn't do anything about it. Um, the, the place that I went was a huge hospital, huge institution. It was UCLA, like one of the highly reputable places to go <clears throat> and they threw it out. And I remember at the time telling people like this happened to me and, and again, the Me Too movement wasn't around yet. There wasn't the vocal kind of like, people weren't talking about this stuff. So I have to tell you, Sylvie, like I, that was another piece of my life where I was like, well, I'm going to blaze a trail. I'm going to do this by myself. Just like when I left my house as a kid on that bike and got the hell out of there. Just like when I got sober and I moved out of my house and all of that happened. And once again, I was like, I got to do what I got to do. Like I've got to be true to myself and find a way to heal and to create a life for myself, like, and have a voice. So I did. So that was your husband. What's that? Did you take that step? Like, because you're, you went to this guy to help you get pregnant, right? Right. Well, and, yeah. To talk, to talk about my irregular pap smear. Yeah. Right. And, but after that, did you, did your husband help you move forward? Like, did you tell him about that? Yeah. I mean, I had some support, but there was kind of a lot. I feel like I can go really deep emotionally and I have access to, you know, like kind of being able to, to go places that maybe other people aren't as comfortable going. So when I would speak out about sexual assault, sexual abuse, it was kind of like, eh, can we just talk about the weather? You know, like there was a lot of that kind of with people in my life. There were some people who really got it, but it's a hard place to access. And I don't think everybody can. And I totally get that now. And first I was like, hey, like I need support. Like, can everybody be on board with me? And he was super supportive when I would, have flashbacks or when I would need like four blankets over me at night because I would be so kind of activated and triggered by what was happening in my life or what had happened. So he, he, he supported me in the way that he could for sure. And, um, I wanted like somebody to get it in a way that like nobody can, unless you've been through it. I mean, I just don't think it's possible. So he was supportive in the way that he could be for sure. Anyway, I'll just say this the file with my chart, my, all of the documentation to the medical board, all of everything that happened and transpired was put in a filing cabinet. And 20 years later, I have it. I have all the documentation from the filing a complaint against that doctor. So fast forward, like that's all happening now. But anyway. Oh, so you've so it's, reopened it. It's open. It's yes. And Is it's he very still public. around. Yeah. 
and hundreds of other women have come forward. Oh my gosh. So it's huge. And I can't go too far into all the details about it. I can only say Is that, that like, part of the, the law that was passed in California at yeah. the end. Okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I'll just bookmark that, but what, yeah. um, yeah. So anyway, I ended up getting pregnant. I have a 21 year old daughter. I have another oh. daughter who's 14 and, um, and they are just absolutely phenomenally amazing human beings and mm -hmm. hilarious and sweet and expressive and like safe in the world in their own amazing ways. And um, they're just like very real, very authentic. And it's like, what else is there? You know, they follow their own path. They do what is true to them. They're not like trying to keep up with their peers they're they're very independent it's just awesome human beings so can I ask you julie so my husband and i um huh can i ask you um do you do you ever sit down with your kids and kind of share your past i think i so do important. and since yeah yeah yeah, it's really, that's a great question. And thank you for asking because um, during the pandemic, my older daughter has come home from college and we've all been together um, in a very concentrated way. And we did start talking uh, and I've been open with them about like, it was, it was a nightmare and, but I wasn't specific and I was, and they know about the, the doctor that assaulted me, but I didn't go into a lot of detail about my, yeah. my childhood until we started to break stuff open when we were like together in a really concentrated way. And I did share with them more in more, um, not specific details, but like that I was molested as a child. Into, yeah. 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 But in a, in an appropriate way, yeah. like mm -hmm. this is, this is all of me. Like, this is my whole story, you know? And I felt like it was, it just intuitively felt like it was time. So um, but they had an idea that it was not an easy life for me, but they didn't know exactly how or why. So with that opened up, it's really, it's like broken open all this great stuff for us. And we, uh -huh. there's just a different kind of communication now. It's really amazing. Yeah. Cause I uh, have, um, a nine and a 10 year old and a, and an 18 year old from my first marriage. Um, she's not with me. She's with her dad, but it's funny because like sometimes I sit with the kids and it usually happens when I'm driving. I'm like, let me just tell you why mommy is the way she is sometimes. <laughs> and right. I just want you to understand that. Yes. You no, know, and I need your help. <laughs> if you, if you yeah. Say that I'm doing this. And, and, I, and it has nothing to do with you, but right. there's some things that I just need you to understand that mommy is like, her parents or, you know, like there's certain things, you know, just like you that, that bring out personalities from your past, you know, like, yeah, absolutely. And I think that it's such a, there's such a level of respect that comes from that. I love that you do that. And I, I have, have had to. the same experience, like, yeah, because it's like, um, understanding me, your husband. yeah, what's that? Oh, sorry. You know, go ahead. Well, just understand that they understand me, it gives, it gives mm -hmm. them an opening to understand themselves in a different kind of way yeah. and the family system and how all of us kind of, how I ended up with their dad and all of it. It just, I think that it's, it plays a huge part in really them feeling like, oh, this, this woman who's my mother trusts me. And there's that reciprocity of openness um, that yeah. I've noticed. That's been the core kind of like there's a, there's a feeling of safety and secure attachment and really like, I can count on this woman because she's real with me. But yeah. if I've got hidden stuff, yeah. it can be like, huh, what, like that, you can, you can tell, that. right? When totally. somebody's kind of like being fake, not fake, but like hiding things, not being so open, you know, like dodging uh, situations and things like that. Completely. Yeah. yeah. So they definitely are, yeah, so there's a lot of, like, communication in that way, and that's great. Um, 
so anyway, my, uh, my now ex-husband and I got divorced after 13 years and we, um, just got along. Okay. Like we've gotten along really, really well over the course of like the last 10, 11 years. And then we've had times when we've disagreed on stuff and we still have been able to come together and communicate, which has been great. And so our story is like, it just, it, it wasn't a match. And, you know, we kind of tried and went in the direction of like going to seven different therapists and like, maybe this one's going to tell us how we can do this. And maybe this one will tell us how we can stay together, but we could, it just was not a match. So we, um, we've been divorced for like a decade. And in the meantime, I, you know, continued to, you know, I stayed sober. My mom died of cirrhosis from alcoholism and um, like 10 years ago. And that was right around the time I was getting divorced. And I had been a stay-at-home mom and had all the, the stuff, all the material stuff. And I was like, I got to actually, I got to get to work. Like, uh-oh, you know. So I started writing for a small newspaper. We were living in Malibu. And I started writing. I, I had the, the job was a two-day-a-week job. I worked until like one in the morning. And I was writing. And um, I was like, oh, my God. Oh, and I, I totally spaced out. I went back to school. And when I went oh, back yeah, to school, right. you yeah, went back to school. I'll fill in the blank here quickly. I'll just <laughs> encapsulate it. I was like, I, I'm a lousy student. I'm never going to do this well. I didn't believe in myself. No one in my family graduated from college. Super smart people, but like no one graduated. And I thought, you know what? Instead of signing up for five classes, I'm going to sign up for one class and just see how I do. And I got an A. And then I signed up for two classes and I was like, see how you do. And I got two A's. And I started to build on that. And that the athletic piece of like, do a little bit, add a little bit more on was something that I, I drew from. And um, so I went back to school. I like, I was writing, I was doing research, I was helping people transfer from, you know, city colleges to universities. I was part of a program um, in Compton in California where we had a gardening program and we helped people, like we all came together as a community in the garden and worked together and we did, we, it was an amazing experience. My college experience in my early 30s was phenomenal. And it gave me a lot of confidence <clears throat> that I used to like say when I needed a job, when I got divorced, like I, I'm a writer and I claimed it. I was like, I am a writer. I can write really well and I can cross over in different genres. And like, I have a talent of like picking up on all kinds of different styles. So I am going to um, focus on writing. And I ended up doing freelance writing and ghost writing and editing manuscripts and all kinds of great stuff. And I created my own business and I did well, which was kind of awesome. I mean, I was scrambling and <laughs> I would kind of awesome. work at different jobs. Yeah, it was pretty cool. But I worked at different jobs and I hated them and I didn't want to work and I resented that I had to work. And I was like, you know, this you're sucks. an entrepreneur when <laughs> I was like an you entrepreneur. Like, I don't want to work for anybody else. I don't want to work for anybody else. And frankly, I don't want to work at all, but fine. <laughs> and I just, but I have to say there was a, there was a time with all the stuff that my dad had done that like, just like drove us into the ground financially and all the kind of like craziness around my mom financially. Money is such a not talked about kind of topic and how it's emotionally driven and it's energetically driven. And like, I was in survival mode. I was always in survival mode. Like, like, like feeling like I had to pick up scraps off the ground to like eat, you know, like I was always in that kind of um, rough and tumble, like I'm not going to be cared for financially. So I had my own experiences with like, I'm, I don't know how to show up for myself in this way. I don't know how to be like self-supporting um, financially. So I had to learn that and it was rough. Um, I went through a lot of, you know, ex like trial and error stuff, but, but I did get the, I did create this business and it did end up being successful. And I did charge like rates that I thought like express, like showed my value and it was pretty cool. And um, 
so over time since the divorce like we've moved a lot and you know it's felt unstable at times and there's been a you know rockiness and discomfort and growing and learning and trying like do, am I even going to do I even want to go on a date with anyone or am I just going to like be single for the rest of my life like what does that look like and yeah. trying that on and just a lot of experimentation over the last decade but I was running that whole time I was doing some trail races I did a lot of running in the mountains I didn't I did road road running but I did mostly I was mostly on the trails for the last like decade and um, climbed Mount Whitney then and had all kinds of like fun stuff that was happening. And, um, and then I had a tibia injury and your tibia is like, seems like no big deal. Like, you know, you have all these other muscles, fine, but oh my God, my tibia, that pain was like, I cannot, I, I've had back stuff over the years, but this was insane pain for me. And um, Once, what's that? Shin splints? Shin splints suck. They are so painful. And it was kind <laughs> of like over, like it was tendony and like real. it was just like, I can't even describe the pain. Shin splints were kind of like, yeah, fine compared to the tibia pain I had. Really? Oh. So freaking painful. And I was like, oh, I'm going to run anyway. Oh, I'll just run when the dirt's not, you know, super hard. I'll run, you know, I'll run kind of sand maybe if I run sand nothing. It was, I was, I was, it was making it so much worse. So the pandemic hit, I'm like, what in the hell am I going to do? Like, I don't have running. And I had a crisis. I was like, ah, I, Why this is last run? year. What's that? Why couldn't you run? My tibia. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. 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 All yeah. right. So this it is, was, this is like last year. Last year. All right. So fast You're forward. Really so I had done all this trail running, all this other stuff. And, um, and I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? I've got to get out of the house. I got to like, I got to stay active and I don't know what I'm going to do. So I went to a foot doctor. I'm like, please tell me I don't need a boot. Please tell me like, this is not going to be a long thing. He's like, yeah, you probably should wear a boot. In the meantime, just don't run and maybe don't even walk. And I was like, well, what the hell can I do? Can I swim? Cause I, I was also a swimmer. And the pool started to close. And he's oh. like, well, you're going to drag your foot anyway. And I don't really want you in the pool doing that motion because it's going to probably hurt. So just like lay off. So the pools ended up closing anyway, so I couldn't swim. So I'm like, well, what the hell am I going to do? He's like, you can ride a bike. I was like, oh, fuck. So I thought, well, here I am now. I'm faced with that feeling of being on my bike as a kid and riding away from the hell that was my home. And I'm like, I, am I ready? Am I ready to get back on a bike and feel whatever comes up for me around what a bike meant to me as a kid? And Sylvia, I have to tell you, like, I had a moment of like, this is a big deal. Cause I, you know, I'm swimming, I'm running, I'm hiking, I'm doing all, I'm out open water swimming. <clears throat> like, why can't I get on a bike, you know? And I realized, like, at that, I was like, that's what it is. It's that emotional tie to all the pain of my childhood. It represents something that I couldn't make that connection until I was like, I kind of want to ride a bike again. So I reached out to some friends. I didn't want to invest in anything. I wasn't going to get like an S-Works, you know, whatever the first day out. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I need a bike. Does anyone have a bike? Like yeah. SOS, you know? And one of my friends said, well, I have this kind of shitty city bike, but it's like in the garage. And if you can pump up the tires and just like get yourself out on it. So I flat pedaled my way around. I had people in my life who had been pro triathletes, um, lots of athletic friends and, and, and this really amazing person in my life at the time, um, got like went out with me and he could have ridden so much faster and so much farther. And I'm flat pedaling and I'm going up giant freaking mountains. And he's like, you have untapped potential. Like you, you can do this. Oh. Like you're good. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, so, so that got the fire in me. And I just started writing and I was like, 
So I would, I would listen to like 70s music when I was on my bike, remembering what it was like to be a kid, remembering riding to the local Sabon to get the bubble yum, having this experience of like, I positive am part. free, the great part, the positive yeah, part. Yeah, the great part. Right? It so I tapped into that. The great part. And that's good because, right, you had two options, the bad part and the good part. That's good. Yeah. 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 And I feel like I folded them into each other. Like I can live like kind of harmoniously with both of them. Like I can experience the pain and at the same time, remember that there was so much beauty in all of it. And I don't have to push away the pain to feel the amazing stuff. But I did draw on like how much joy it gave me and how much I loved it. And so I've just, I just, I'm writing four days a week, sometimes five days a week. I'm trying to do some dynamic stretching. So I'm not like stiff and, you know, feeling <laughs> like shit on the bike, but I'm so in love. And, um, I, I upgraded another person gave me their like sort of mediocre. Hi. Hello. Like, I got know. like a, what's that? Oh, wait, I can't hear you. He said, take me for a walk. Oh, there you go. <laughs> right, so like... Exactly. Um, so anyway, uh, I started, I started, I, someone gave me another bike and I got some good pedals and I started to like, I got better shoes and I got some kits and I was like, I'm going to get a better helmet and the one that doesn't like make me you know, have neck pain because it weighs 25 pounds and I'm like learning and understanding how this whole thing works. But I feel sometimes I'm so clumsy and I cross, I was cross chaining every two seconds for a while. And oh, at least you know what that is. Right, exactly. <laughs> but, well, I was taught very quickly, like, don't do that. That you don't, yeah. that you don't do. But, um, I really have had this amazing, I've just, I've had, um, uh, this this guy who's you know was a very important part of my life um really helped to you know he he was he wasn't my coach by any stretch but he was just so patient with me and so great and took me out like on beautiful rides so we live in a place that people travel to from all over the world to ride like the Santa Monica Malibu area is filled with amazing amazing road by it's stuff. Very nice. you gotta come we gotta ride I know, together now i know somebody there and actually i have a friend who um does uh wine tours in um the napa valley nice so i don't know how far that is from you but he knows all the wineries and i'm like hey if we ever are able to go anywhere, we'll have to do a cycling training camp in the Napa Valley, and you are going to be our tour guide to all the wineries, or just follow us. Oh, cool! So we can buy right <laughs> buy to all of them. I love it. I know. How fun. Yeah, that's that's some hours away, but there's California is just ridiculous, and if you could ever get down here to I've never been to California. I've been to San Diego. Oh my God. That's a, and, and Vancouver, of course. <laughs> but I've never yeah, been to Yeah, so San Diego's like south of us, but yeah, yeah. from Los Angeles up to the Napa Valley and, you know, north of here, there's just so much amazing riding. So I've been taking advantage of it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. We've seen pros on the road and I didn't know who they were. And someone's like, oh my God, so-and-so yeah. just passed us. And I was like, Oh my God, that's cool. Like they come here, you know, during, yeah. you know, the winter. And, um, but anyway, it's been an amazing experience. And so I'll just share with you that most yes. recently, um, I was, I had this opportunity to return to what happened when I was, you know, getting pregnant and looking at all of that stuff. And I, um, I'm now, advocating for people to be able to file lawsuits against people who have assaulted them and sometimes passed and it's like well they say it's too late but trauma doesn't expire you know like you don't just all of a sudden one day everything's fine and you know 
and or all of a sudden like you can have a memory after 20 years and not have not having one so i was able to i was asked to um to speak on behalf of getting a law passed to help people with that specific to the case that i'm in but i'm really looking towards you know advocating for for people who might not have memories for 20 30 years but want to you know seek justice and so that's a huge passion for me now. And um, so, yeah, and I'm just, uh, my life today is, you know, it's got all of its stuff. Like I've just kind of invited the, like the idea that life is kind of messy sometimes and it can be really stable and it can be really awesome. And it can also be messy. Relationships can be messy you know, families can be messy. It doesn't mean it's chaotic. It doesn't mean that it's my past and my childhood, but just understanding like my humanness, my ex's humanness, everybody, like my kids' humanness, we're all just kind of like, you know, we blow it sometimes and sometimes we do great stuff. And most of the time we're just kind of like living our best lives, right? Like that's, that's the kind of the goal. So I've just kind of relaxed into my life and I don't feel, you know, like every day is a struggle kind of thing. When stuff comes up, I deal with it, but um, I, I don't live in a state of like activated trauma every, every minute anymore. You know, I certainly have my moments, but I work really, really hard to find the joy. And I've got to tell you, bike, biking has saved my ass this past year and I can't wait to see what's to come. Yeah. Aren't we all? I don't know what kind of state your state is in, but uh, ours just went into lockdown again. And uh, I have a women's cycling club here in Quebec, Ontario, and we're just like, we were able to effectively have a season kind of last year where we we're like basically all of us came out of the, the dark and you know, it was, it was something that kept all of us pretty sane, I have to say, um, just being able to ride and, you know, in smaller groups like they wanted, which was fine. We just made more groups uh, mm -hmm. of the ladies who wanted to come out. But, you know, like, I think that was a huge, you know, hugely good for our mental health, all of us. You know, the first ride when we got out, there's like four or five of us. And honestly, all we want to do is talk because we've <laughs> all been stuck in with our kids doing homeschooling. Right. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I'm like, we should just order, order pizza and go to the Depinar and get some beer and call our husbands to pick us up because we can't bike home. Seriously. <laughs> right. Right. But, you know, and, um, I'm really grateful that we were able to continue doing that as a club for our club members. Cause we had like a hundred before everything got wow. shut down. Yeah. Wow. And, um, and the amount of women, first time women who purchased bikes last year, extraordinary. How many women's yeah. groups or women were out riding? Like it was awesome. It was like amazing. So, yes. you know, now it's finding all those women and having them join our club and learn Yay. how to ride their bikes, you know? Yeah, <laughs> well, and definitely. Yeah. And there is another side to this. Like, we'll get to the other side of this. And then we're going to have, you know, like people who, like you said, who can join that club. And, you know, I mean, I think there's, there's been so much that's happened, but I feel like there's going to be some great stuff that comes out of this on the other side of it. I can't see it quite yet, but I know it's there. So yeah, I'm just so, so grateful. Um, I'm grateful for my life. I'm grateful for, for you, for asking me. And um, well, I'm, great. so I'm grateful much. that we found each other because it was just me funny because I hadn't been on that page in, in a while. And I scrolled down. I was like, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, it's a great story. And the Aww. thing is, Julie, is that um, I'm trying to find more women to be on the podcast who are cyclists. Because, you know, 
I mean, there's abundance of men. I'm sorry. <laughs> there's abundance of men. Yeah, to talk, it's just to the talk demographic. To who are like yeah. coaches and this and that and cyclists, but yeah. women are kind of like behind the scenes. It's, um, mm -hmm. and some don't want to share their voice, which is yeah. not really what my podcast is about, but um, everybody has a story and some people have like extraordinary stories like yourself and that's, oh, and, and I love that because I think things like there's more of you and me who are out there that for you know, sure sport helped us, whether it was, you know, just being active at school or picking up your bike or, or becoming a runner or something that, um, you know, helped us get through our hard times when we are, you know, for sure. Or, or even now, you know, um, yeah. um, and even now women, um, there's such a, there's so many of us, but there's a lack of, um, especially with the teenagers. And that's something that I'm kind of working towards is, um, is building, there's a gap to be filled especially in, if you're going to talk about the sport and, and development of women in sport. And there's that, there's a gap in cycling um, from like 13 to 20 or 13 to 19. Um, mm -hmm. They drop off more, more mm -hmm. guys stay in sport um, than girls. Um, yeah. So I'm really looking to develop a program where uh, we can bring we can develop a program to develop girls in sport of cycling oh, and give them that, that pathway, right? You know, I cause yeah. And, and I've been, oh, you froze. Oh, am I back? Am I back? I lost can you hear you. me? I can hear you. Oh, there yeah, you are. you're coming. You're coming in and out. Oh, am I back? I've got you now. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So because I've been working with, with adult, like for my cycling club for the last 13 years. So it's, it's easier for me to work with older women. It's, it's the younger uh -huh. women that I guess I'm just totally intimidated. Maybe it's the parents, I don't mm. know. but I need to get past <laughs> that. Right. Yeah. I need yeah. to get past that to be able to offer these girls and being a female coach myself and a racer. Um, and I've, I've, I'm finding other women. Like I want to be this like coached by women, supported by women. Um, yes. like just, you know, everything anyways. Yeah. It, and I just get so <gasps> about this and I need to start working on it you know, like, yeah, really like putting it into play, but I like, right. that, you, know, you know, cycling found you and you're moving forward with that, um, that bill or the law in California and, and your daughters are on board and it's, yeah. it's really good. It's really good. And if there's a way that I can support you supporting women and, you know, younger girls, well, we can, can definitely have a conversation about it because, <laughs> you know, what I have to offer is passion. And, um, and I think that counts for a huge amount, you know, like you have expertise and, and passion and, and I'll build on my knowledge, but, you know, having the love for it, I think is the, like the huge thing. And so there's definitely more to talk about for sure. Oh, there definitely is. We we'll probably yeah. have to bring you back and find out what's going on after the summer or over a it. year. And yeah. uh, but yes, yeah, I just pray that we can travel at some point. Like, oh, it'd be nice, <laughs> it'd be Good. really nice. Well, my uh, doggie's calling me, yes. Well, I thank you so much, thank um, you, Sylvie. for sharing your story. Um, believe it or not, you're gonna be live on the podcast very soon, I think, in cool. April. Great. Um, and uh, that's gonna be amazing. Thank you. Well, just let me know and we'll stay in touch for sure. Oh, well, yes, of course. I have all your information and you will, anyways, we're going to thank you. So thanks to all thank of our you. listeners 
for tuning in to this episode of Secrets from the Saddle with Julie Wallach. <laughs> right? Yay. You got it. Yay. Oh, my God. Um, so and, proud of uh, you. Oh, thanks. And, uh, sure. I'm not going to make you say my name, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but, uh, and don't forget to like, comment, and share this with others who you feel would touch them. I mean, this is a great story um, and you're going to hear more amazing stories. So thank you everybody and have yourself an amazing day. You too. Take care. Bye. Bye.